In the afternoon session, we have um, uh, Deborah Rogers, Energy Policy for Forum, Fort Worth, Texas. Um, Deborah began her financial career in London, working in investment banking. Upon her return to the US, she worked as a financial consultant for several major Wall Street firms, including Merrill Lynch and Smith Barney. In 2003, Deborah started her own enterprise with the founding of Deborah's Farmstead, a cheese-making operation, and quickly established the company as one of the premier artisan dairies and cheesemakers in the US, the cheese having won several major national awards. She was appointed to the US Extractive Industry Transparency Initiative, an advisory committee within the US Department of Interior in 2013 for a three-year term. In May 2013, she was invited to testify before the Senate Committee on Energy and Natural Resources. In July 2013, she participated in a working group at EIA, the Energy Information Administration of the US Department of Energy. She was appointed in 2001 by the Texas Commission on Environmental Quality to a task force reviewing placement of air monitors in the Barnett Shale region in light of air quality concerns brought forth by the natural gas operations in North Texas. In June 2012, she was invited to speak in Rio de Janeiro at the International Society for Ecological Economics in conjunction with the United Nations Rio Plus 20 World Summit. She is a member of the Board of Earthworks. She is also a founder of Energy Policy Forum, a consultancy and educational forum dedicated to policy and financial issues regarding shale gas and renewable energy. In addition, she lectures on shale, on shale gas economics throughout the US and abroad at universities, business venues and public forums. She has also been featured in articles discussing the financial anomalies of shale gas in the New York Times, Rolling Stone magazine and London Guardian. In addition, she appears in the documentary Gasland 2. So we are very fortunate to have such a, uh, a, a distinguished speaker among us. Uh, will, Deborah is going to speak on the topic of cost-benefit analysis of unconventional gas extraction. So I give you Deborah Rogers. Thank you so much for inviting me here. Um, I have to tell you, when Aideen first rang me or emailed me and uh, invited me to Ireland, I was so excited because I haven't been to Ireland in a number of years. And I always used to tell people, um, go to Ireland. It's Europe's best kept secret. It really was. And this was going back to the 80s. Um, and I just think it's, um, I, I don't know, I, I, Ireland holds a special place in my heart, I guess I should say. So, all right. We're going to, I'm going to take you on a very um, whirlwind tour of shales and what's happened with shales from an economic point of view in the United States. And it's going to go very quickly and I'm going to cover a lot of ground, but don't worry if, if, you, if there are gaps or something, you know, just let me know at the end and we'll answer, I'll stay here and answer questions as long as you like. Okay, I'm of the opinion that shale gas would have unraveled in the United States sometime shortly after the economic downturn if it weren't for the Wall Street investment banks. The Wall Street identified um, an opportunity which turned out to be exceedingly lucrative for them in shales. Uh, before the mortgage-backed securities crisis, mortgage-backed securities derivatives and, and other products were the number one profit center in these large investment banks. That was supplanted by shales after 2009. So how, what did they do? Well, they essentially used the same playbook that they used with mortgage-backed securities. Um, and you may recall they, there was a lot of use of, well, they bundled mortgages, first of all, which created an opacity within the products and made it very difficult to get a handle on what was actually happening and what were the underlying investments. They, they encouraged a lot of debt. They encouraged debt amongst people who were not necessarily sophisticated enough to understand the, the risks that they were taking on. They encouraged off-balance sheet financing. Um, and they've essentially done the same thing in shales, which is quite interesting. This is a quote taken from Risk Magazine. Risk Magazine is a magazine that deals with mergers and acquisitions primarily in the, within the financial community. And they give an award every year for Risk Deal of the Year. And Barcap won this award for a Chesapeake volumetric production payment deal. But as you'll see, this is one of the executives at Barcap essentially bragging um, that he's followed the same playbook that they essentially followed for mortgage-backed securities. And that is 
that um, they guided the ratings agencies. I, I'm sorry, I, I neglected to state that. You may recall that leading up to the crisis, or after the crisis rather, we found out that they had essentially reverse engineered quite a few products in order to meet ratings agency rating agencies' higher requirements. And so even though it looked like they had AAA ratings, they were actually rubbish underneath. Well, you see it happening here again. We had to guide the ratings agencies and institutional investors, and he readily admits who did not necessarily have deep familiarity with the energy business. I have a problem with this because those institutional investors in many cases that he's talking about are pension funds, and that's people's retirements. So you see that they're essentially doing the same thing, but this time the banks were smarter. The reason there was such a problem with uh, in 2008 globally is because the toxic assets were on the bank's books in so many cases. This time they've transferred them off the bank's books and but used the same game plan. Bundling leases in shales was probably the biggest money maker and kept shales going even though the, the underlying well production and well performance was not working they were still able to make money in the beginning because of this, and this was the shale land grab. And this is Aubrey McClendon, who was CEO of Chesapeake Energy, the uh, second largest gas driller in the U.S., and he's bragging in an analyst call with financial analysts that I can assure you that buying leases for X and selling them for five to ten times X is much more profitable than trying to produce gas at five to six. Gas has not been at five to six MCF in the United States for quite some time now. Uh, they overproduce, and I'll get into that in just a moment. Um, but as you can see, this was, um, they would oftentimes, now you have a little bit different, you have a very different um, scenario here, but in the United States, we own our mineral rights. And what they were doing was they were going in and offering farmers, say, 500, maybe if you were lucky, in some cases, $1,000 an acre. It did get bid up at one point, especially where I live, it went up to $30,000 an acre that they were willing to pay. Uh, but they would typically offer $500 to $1,000 an acre, and they would flip that acre to another oil and gas company, and I'll explain, go into that in more detail, but they would flip it for as much as twenty dollars to $25,000 an acre. So they were making considerable money doing that. And the facade behind which they did it was natural gas, although they were producing, um, the wells weren't really producing up to um, um, operator projections, not even close. We're going to go into that. Okay, so the industry, when I first started speaking out, they said, um, and, and throughout, they, they've, they've um, accused me of being a conspiracy theorist. Well, I don't believe in conspiracy theories. I believe in math. And the math is actually quite simple here. My, um, my view is that the investment banks, through um, their, um, well, they would put, okay, let me back up. The investment banks put production targets on all these companies, and the way they do that is um, they state, that's one of the primary metrics if you're a financial analyst and you're looking at an oil and gas company, you look to see have they met a production target, can they show growth in production year over year. It's one of the, the very primary tar uh, metrics that they use. So you can take the existing production in the U.S. or any place else where they produce gas, and you can look at these companies' production targets and you know they're going to jump through any number of hoops to try and meet those targets because if they don't, those analysts will downgrade their stock, which in turn gives them less access to the capital markets. So it's very important to meet these targets. So what they did was, and, and I did this exercise back in 2010 and saw where it was going, you take the existing production number, you add the production target to it, and it becomes a, a, what I call a significant number. But what I noticed right off was that that number was much, much higher than current demand in the U.S., which meant we were, late, we were heading towards a surplus. And if you go to a surplus, prices go in one direction and one direction only, and that's down. I spotted this back in 2010. I think other, and I didn't even look at it until then, so I know the banks knew about it. It's my opinion that those banks put pressure on these companies to continue producing. They encouraged them to take on a great amount of debt, so they had to keep producing in order to make, meet debt service, and they had to keep producing in order to meet production targets. That, in turn, opened the door for the banks to make significant fees, and that's exactly what happened. If you look at this, this is the value of mergers and acquisition deals that Wall Street took in. 
This is in 2008 when the price of natural gas averaged about $8 in MCF, and then it began to plummet. And as you can see, as it plummeted, the value of deals in M&A went up for these banks. And I'm talking about the Goldman Sachs of the world, Bank of America, Merrill Lynch. Um, it's all the usual suspects is what I call them. But they made a huge amount of money, and shales became the number one profit center in those banks. And I think that is what has driven this shale frenzy over the past, past few years. Now, do I have a problem with investment banks making money? Of course not. That's what you're supposed to do as an investment banker. You're supposed to put together deals and make fees. Here's where I have the problem. Within months, literally within months, you started seeing massive write-downs in these same shale assets that had just been flipped by the, by the companies and the banks. So you had, and by the way, this is the second round of massive write-downs in shale in the U.S. since 2009. This is the most recent one. This was last year. Uh, in Canada, 1.7 billion. You can see these are very large numbers. My favorite one is BHP Billiton, who went in and bought all of Chesapeake's uh, Fayetteville shale assets, 100% of them, paid about $4 billion for them, and 18 months later wrote off over 50% of the purchase price. Um, now, the only good thing to come out of that, because that was significant shareholder destruction, is that this man, uh, Marius Kloppers, who is the CEO of BHP, he didn't get his bonus last year. <laughs> so, and I think he was very upset about that. I'm sure he was. He was making quite a bit of money. But anyway, um, that's a problem. You're, these losses and these write downs are continuing. We just saw within the last month or so uh, companies the size of Shell and ExxonMobil writing down their shale assets to such a degree that it impacted ExxonMobil's earnings by 60% drop 60%. That's huge for a company that enormous and that diversified. And it was from Shales. Um, Shell announced that they're probably, they're looking to sell off 50% of their Shale assets. Uh, and they took a $2 billion hit. Um, so that's problematic <coughs> for economics. I really wish I'd coined this term because I just think I love it. It's so great. But um, the London's FT actually coined this term. So let's go in and kind of look at the background and look at what are the underlying fundamentals of shale, because I think it's important. First of all, I'd like to address this question of why are shales so hyped? I think, in a word, it's competition, interestingly enough. What if I were to tell you that there are actually deals being done quietly, you don't read about them too much, but they are actually being done, that um, are investing in core infrastructure projects with high gross margins and revenues that are fixed for 20 to 25 years. Now everybody in a low interest rate environment is chasing yield and they're chasing anything that they can lock in for any length of time. These projects are offering double digit rates of return in this interest rate environment. Guess what those projects are? They're large commercial scale wind and solar. Um, our clean in the U.S., our clean economy grew by 8.3% during the economic downturn. That was over twice what the regular economy, um, the, uh, the average of the regular economy. So you can see this isn't lost on the oil and gas industry, I can assure you. And so the more they can convince us that we can rock along, that we have cheap and abundant sources of hydrocarbons for decades and decades to come, it's in their interest to do so because then it will be business as usual and it will impact perhaps investment going forward in green technologies and that is indeed what has happened to some degree in the US. We also hear a lot about jobs from the oil and gas industry and I find this um, particularly interesting. I went in, when you hear these glowing reports coming out of the US on jobs created by shales, the, these numbers are without exception taken from economic models, they're projections. And um, economic models, as anybody who's taken Economics 101 knows, economic models are only as good as their input. And you can essentially reverse any economic model to make it say whatever you want it to say. You just change the numbers up. So I'm always very skeptical of economic models. I don't like to use them in my work. I, I prefer to just look at what's actually happened. So that's what I did. I went in and I pulled the figures from the Bureau of Labor Statistics. And this is what I found, which I thought was very, very interesting indeed. And I wasn't expecting to find this, by the way. But I found it nevertheless. Direct industry jobs. Forget about all the peripheral jobs that they add on. Um, and I'm going to touch, well, let me touch on that first because it, it, it'll bring a little bit of comic relief. When we got in and started parsing out some of these industry economic models, we found that some of the jobs that they claimed they were creating 
were things like strippers and prostitutes. I'm not kidding. Um, and arguably that is job creation. It's just not the sort of job creation that you or I hope for or think of when we hear these glowing job numbers. Um, nevertheless, so I went in and I just looked at the people just employed by oil and gas. This number, by the way, isn't just shales. This is for all oil and gas in the U.S., onshore, offshore. But these are direct industry jobs, about 181,000. Renewables, and in this, I only counted wind, solar, and geothermal. Renewables accounted for 183,000, interestingly enough. So the jobs numbers were relatively even. But then I thought, well, you can't stop there. You've got to make you know, proper comparisons. And so I went in to look at what percentage of total energy generation capacity does oil and gas provide in the U.S., and it's 45%, whereas renewables are only providing 15%. That means that renewables are creating significantly more jobs per kilowatt than oil and gas, and I can promise you that is not lost on the oil and gas industry, and I'm of the opinion that that's why we get these reports about once a month stating we're going to create 600,000 jobs. And they, they even claim 200,000 in the state of Ohio alone. Um, they, they get a little bit giddy sometimes. But. So, another fundamental. Believe it or not, the majors are actually struggling and have been for about a decade. Um, the majors have not been able to grow reserves materially in over a decade. And why is that a problem? Well, if you're an oil and gas company, uh, that's another one of the primary metrics that you look at. Um, this, by the way, is Rex Tillerson, CEO of ExxonMobil, in case you were wondering who that man was. Um, not one of my favorite people, I have to say. But anyway, um, they have to show that they are replacing reserves because why? If you've got a finite product, you're, you're selling it off, people are using it on a daily basis, and if you don't replace those reserves, you're just, you're just going to deplete yourself down to zero. So it's one of the primary metrics. Interestingly enough, one quarter of the major's reserves over the last decade has come from nothing but acquisitions. Nothing but acquisitions. In other words, they're just going over to a smaller oil and gas company and saying, we're going to take your marbles and we're going to pull them over here into our giant pile. And the other things that they've been doing, which are interesting, is share buybacks, share repurchases. And that sounds, it may sound complicated, but it's really not. What, what they're doing, it's, it's a little bit of accounting smoke and mirrors to my mind, because they go in and you want to see growth in earnings per share, right? You want to see that because that shows a company's healthy and it's growing. The majors, in order to get around that, because they wouldn't have growth if they didn't do it this way, they go in and they repurchase their own shares so that there are fewer shares in the market, and then they divide their earnings into fewer shares, and it makes it look like they're still on this upward trajectory in, in earnings per share. Now, admittedly, a financial analyst sees through that immediately, but nevertheless, they do that, and ExxonMobil has been doing it. They've been buying back their shares $5 billion a quarter for the last four or five, six years. Five billion dollars a quarter, that's 20 billion a year, doing nothing but buying their own shares back. Um, I find that interesting. Again, taking ExxonMobil, if you look at their reserve replacement ratio, uh, they announced it for 2012, a few months ago, and I was, I was shocked. And the reason I was shocked is that when you got down, you know, they had all the glowing language at the top of the press report, but when you got down into the meat and potatoes of it, what you saw was 40% um, of the world's largest publicly traded oil and gas company, 40% of their reserve replacement is coming from shales, two shale plays, the Woodford and the Bakken. I'm going to go into more detail about this in a minute. The Woodford is in severe decline. We already know that. There are two rigs in the Woodford right now, two rigs, that's it. The Bakken, we now know from production history, um, actual production history, not company projections, actual production history, we know that the average well in the Bakken is ready to be abandoned at year six. And 40% of ExxonMobil's reserve replacements are coming from that. I think that's a troubling, um, a troubling, what am I trying to say? I think that's troubling. Um, <laughs> and, and I think that what it said to me, personally, was um, maybe we're not aware of perhaps how serious this problem is of finding new forms of hydrocarbons. Um, recovery efficiencies. What this means is uh, if you look to conventional oil and gas wells, you could, and, and does everybody know the difference, by the way, between conventional and unconventional? Because I can very briefly define it if someone needs me to. Please do. Please define do. it. Okay. 
Um, conventional gas wells are the old-fashioned boiler gas wells. And basically what you did was you did your geology, hopefully, and you did it well, and you found a sea or a pool of oil or gas, and you dropped your drill bit in, and you, like a straw almost, I mean, that's a very simplified, but still, like a straw, and you drop it in, and you suck it out, right? So they could typically get um, 75 to 80% of gas or oil in place they could extract. With shales, they're getting about 6.5% on average uh, recovery efficiency. And that's simply because of the way their fracture stimulated. You have to go in and you have to explode the rock. The rock, you release the gas and oil. That's why shale wells, by the way, the most gas or oil they will ever produce is in typically the first 12 months. And then it drops off a cliff. And um, oftentimes, once they pull the gas or oil out, they do use propens and so forth to prop the shale up. But those give way in the end, and the shale collapses in on itself. In 2009, they came into my neck of the woods in the Barnett, North Texas, and they tried refracts. And you hear a lot, you still hear industry talking about refracts. Well, it didn't work. They didn't increase production meaningfully, and it was very, very expensive to do. So you can see there's a little bit of a problem here with recovery efficiencies. This is very um, damning, I think, and troubling. This is energy returned on energy invested, and it's a simple um, ratio. In the early days of crude in the U.S., and all this talks about is basically how much energy are you expending to get energy out. And so in the early days of crude, we would spend in the U.S. one barrel of crude to get 100 barrels out. Today, that's dropped down to one barrel to get 11 barrels out. But with these unconventionals like tar sands and shale oils or shale gas, they're, they're very dismal indeed. Um, tar sands, we know, is about one barrel to get three barrels out. Now, at some point, that starts really not making sense um, because you're using up a finite resource to get a very small amount out. Shales, we're still doing the work, um, but it looks like it's going to come in somewhere between three and five. So I put five just to be conservative. So we now know that we have a troubling dependence on low EROEI fuels. In other words, we have a troubling dependence globally on hydrocarbons that are not cheap to extract and are not nearly as abundant as the energy industry would have us believe. Externalities. This has proved quite interesting. I've been doing some work this summer on this, and what I've found is um, we hear a lot from the, the industry that they're going to provide significant tax revenues. Uh, and they do provide tax revenue, but it's not even close to covering the cost of the damage that they're doing. And this is just looking at road damages. This isn't looking at pollution costs, and we're starting to do some work on that with the, the nitrous oxides and VOCs to see, because those are precursors to ozone formation, and ozone damages agricultural crops, it, dam it damages you, our health, and so we're starting to do work on that. But this is just road damages. So if you look at the state of Texas, this is for 2012. Um, Texas, and this is not just for shales, it's for all oil and gas in Texas. 3.6 billion, but our road damage from drilling is 4, 4 billion. Um, North Dakota has taken in 3.3 billion since 2010. That's a, a number added up over several years. But the road damage by uh, North Dakota Department of Transportation, and by the way, these are all from state comptrollers and, and our Department of Transportation. Uh, road damage is estimated at 7 billion. Somebody's going to pick up that tab, and it is, isn't going to be the oil and gas industry. Same thing in Pennsylvania. They were really foolish. Pennsylvania did not institute a severance tax on oil and gas until, I think it was too late 2011, early 2012. They've only taken in $204 million, and they've got $3.5 billion in road damage just from drilling. Arkansas, the same thing. Um, so you can see somebody's got to cover these costs. The other interesting thing is... Um, now, in the U.S., thanks to Dick Cheney and George Bush, uh, that industry is exempt from all major environmental statutes in the U.S., but they're not exempt here in Europe. If you were to, um, every one of these pad sites has the potential to be a Superfund site because of the chemicals they use during hydraulic fracturing. Somebody's going to have to clean that up as well. So I would encourage you... Um, you know, when you're looking at the overall costs and what you, I, I, I was talking to a minister yesterday and they were saying that you have these funds for reclamation and so forth. Well, you most decidedly need to be 
um, concerned about things like this and covering your own costs because essentially what these companies are doing is privatizing profits and socializing costs. Here's another interesting thing. So um, you're starting to see a lack of confidence within the industry itself, which I find very interesting. And um, I'm going to give you a couple of examples here. Uh, in the Marcellus, the New York State, you probably know, has had a moratorium on drilling for the last few years. Norse Energy decided they wanted to exit New York State, so they put all of their leases up for sale. Now, they were supposed to have had leases in the areas most that had the most potential for New York State. They put them up for sale in 2011, late 2011. And a year later, in December of 2012, nobody had bought them. No one wanted them within the industry. Now, presumably, the industry has been making, you know, talking about, well, that moratorium is going to be lifted at some point. Well, if it is, then those leases ought to have value, but nobody wanted them. Same thing happened with Anschutz Exploration in New York. They didn't even try to sell their leases. They just abandoned them. And, and I'm talking about costs that they've already embedded in these projects to the tune of hundreds of millions of dollars, and they're just walking away from it. No one will buy them. But my favorite, my favorite, is the Bakken in North Dakota. In the Bakken, um, a company called Wanta um, wanted to build a pipeline, a crude pipeline, from the Bakken carrying the Bakken crude down to Cushing, Oklahoma, to the re big refinery center in Cushing, Oklahoma. They couldn't get anybody in the industry to pony up the money. Now, why? That is such a huge red flag. It leaped right off the page at me. And I'll tell you why I think it is. And, I, and, and interestingly enough, I wrote an article on this, and it got picked up by all sorts of industry publications and reposed. But the reason, the only reason for this, because pipelines are cash cows. They're very expensive to build. You have ex ex extensive upfront costs. But once you've recouped those costs, um, they, and, and you have a product that's going to last decades and decades to come, like they promised us shale will, then you have this income stream and you, you just have a cash cow on your hands for you know, 20, 30, 40 years. No one would put the money up in the Bakken because we now know from examining the actual production history that the average well in the Bakken is played out by year six. It's done. It's ready to be abandoned by year six. So they don't have this long window of opportunity. They can, they can spend the, the money for the pipeline, but th they know the crude isn't going to last there. So all this talk about two Saudi Arabias sitting in North Dakota, it's just it's rubbish. And the industry recognizes that. So what did the industry do? They put this great spin on it, and they said, we're going to ship um, crude by rail. Well, shipping crude by rail costs three times as much as shipping crude by a pipeline. That tells you right there. They're willing to pay that extra expense because they know we have a finite window here. It's very short, and we need to just get the crude out and, and be done with it. So I think that that's an interesting um, aspect of this is the, their own lack of confidence within the industry. So what's happening with the companies? Now, for those of you who don't have business backgrounds, um, I, won't, I won't dwell on this very long because I don't want you to all fall asleep. But if you look at CapEx, which is just, um, it stands for capital expenditure. If you look at what these companies have spent um, over uh, drilling and completing wells, it's quite staggering. And um, let me go to the next slide. What I looked at was I took five different companies, and these are companies, large um, oil and gas companies, and they're trading in both shale oil and shale gas in the U.S., and I, I used them because I could have used ExxonMobil's and so forth, but they're so large and diversified that it's hard to, to parse out from just looking at their financial statements how much of it is shale. These companies only do shales, okay? So we're not muddying the waters here. And what I found was between 2010 and 2012, these five companies, and it's only five companies, there are lots of others doing it, but these five companies spent $56 billion dollars drilling and completing shale gas or oil wells. But their free cash flow, as you can see, in every case, is it's non-existent. In fact, it's been deteriorating. If you look, um, in some cases, deterioration, 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 deterioration. That's the only one, Chesapeake Energy. But Chesapeake Energy, interestingly enough, um, if you look at their free cash in 2010, it was roughly about $3 billion. But since that time, Chesapeake Energy has sold $15 billion worth of assets and their free cash flow hasn't improved at all. 
So that tells you the underlying health of these companies is in serious jeopardy. This is a picture of where I live, believe it or not. This is what shale gas looks like when it comes to town. This is a Google map, a satellite image of Barnett in Texas. And I live right about there. And each one of these red dots is not a well. It's a pad site with multiple wells, anywhere from about 4 to 24 wells per pad site. There are 18,000 wells in this area. That's the kind of density that you're talking about with shale gas. They have to do it that densely because of the way they fracture stimulate. Now, the problem with this is that the industry will, will tell you that shale plays are statistical plays. They expect 20% of the wells to carry the entire play, and that means 20% of the wells will make you money, and the other 80% will easily be uneconomic. They'll be dry holes, basically, or they'll be, they just won't make enough money to make it worthwhile. <laughs> If you live here, like I do, right about there, more than likely I live next to one of the 80% that's not making any money. And I can tell you I do because nobody around me is making any money off royalty checks. But, um, I mean, the odds are I'm going to live with that. But all of us who live in this area live with all of that environmental degradation. Now, I'm not here to make value judgments or anything. I just like to talk about numbers. But there's, these are heavy industrial activities, and there's no way any human being can look at that kind of density and think there aren't going to be repercussions. Sorry, and, what's the area of that? Um, that it, that's a fairly large area. Um, it's probably, gosh, uh, in miles, what would it be? Maybe... I'd have to get back to you on that because I don't want to guess at this. It's a fairly large area. It's North Texas. It, it, it encompasses... It's the size of Ireland? Or? Um, no, it probably wouldn't be quite the size of Ireland. Um, but it's probably how far, close. How far, how far apart are those two towns? Um, well, some of them... Typically, the pad sites are half a mile apart north, south, east, and west. It's a grid pattern, just spread out, half a mile apart. And you, they're everywhere. And the industry, unfortunately, in the United States, and especially in Texas, because um, oil and gas is so endemic to our culture, no one questioned. And the industry readily admitted, they said, we started in Fort Worth because we knew nobody would question us, and we could do what we wanted. We have um, multiple well pad sites 200 feet from elementary schools. I'm not kidding. Um, I have a problem with that. This shows you the true drilling treadmill. This is from my hometown, but I could give you, I could sit here for the rest of the afternoon and give you example after example after example of this. And this is the problem with shales. The old wells deplete so rapidly that you have to ha engage in this frenzy of drilling in order to keep new production coming online because the old wells are depleting too rapidly. They have not been able to do, keep production stable in any shale play in the U.S. to date. This is a great example of it because we think we're going to be rich, right? Shale gas is coming to town, they tell us we're going to be rich, we're going to make all this money. That's exactly what the city of Fort Worth thought in 2008. And we took in $50 million from only 44 gas wells. Now, this includes signing bonuses and all of that, but, but anyway, we took in $50 million and everybody thought they were going to be, I'm not kidding, they coined this term, a shale-yonaire. <laughs> By the end of 2012, the city only received $23 million in revenues, but look at the number of wells we had tenfold increase, essentially, in the number of wells and over 50% decrease in revenues. That is shale. If you don't remember anything else, remember that. You will get some economic benefit in the very early stages, and then it will drop off a cliff, but in the meantime, they will continue to ramp up drilling because it's the only way they can make these things look like they're even remotely working, is to engage in a frenzy of drilling. And we actually ran the numbers to figure out on all the shale plays in the U.S., they would need to add, um, they would need to spend something like $50 billion per annum in the U.S. alone just to keep production stable. Not to even grow it, but just to keep it stable. That's not, they can't do that. That's so far beyond the capacity of the industry at present. I mean, they would have to have, you know, like some miracle from heaven to help them. And then to close up, this is, um, just because I think this is sort of interesting, to again show you the density of the wells and what they're doing now. I'm ashamed to say that of all the first world countries, the United States is the only one um, that still allows flaring. It's an antiquated process. There's absolutely no reason to use it. They use it because it's cheap. But it is highly polluting. Um, 
they, you can, there have been studies done for the Canadian government uh, and they noted that benzene, which is a known human carcinogen, is still at quantifiable levels uh, as much as three and a half miles downwind of a natural gas flare. The, this is the flaring in the Bakken Formation. The Bakken Formation is in the middle of nowhere. It, I mean, you're out in the prairie in a pasture, and look, it looks like a city now, and all they're doing is burning off natural gas because the prices are so low in the U.S. they don't even think it's worth their while to keep it. That, to me, is the most egregious mismanagement of natural resources. Um, all these wells, oh, another thing about the Bakken, because you're starting to hear a lot about shale oil, and I promise you they will start talking about it here, um, but what we're finding is that the Bakken production actually peaked in June of 2010, three years ago, but the number of wells has doubled. And, and remember, that's just the same story that I just gave you about the city of Fort Worth. Um, this one, all right, you're seeing the same thing in the Bakken. It peaked per production, I mean per well production peaked three years ago. They've doubled the well, so it looks like production's still growing, but you're about to see, you're going to see the Bakken taper so out here. So they're the taking next. oil out and just burning the gas. That's, that's why right. they're, That's yeah. exactly right, because the gas is just worthless to them right now. It's so cheap. <clears throat> Industry is flaring or wasting enough gas to power all the homes in Chicago and Washington combined for a year. This is the Eagle Ford. And I mean, it's down, I'm from Texas, this is, this is down in the Chihuahua Desert. This is the Eagle Ford. Oh, sorry, this is Eagle Ford. And look at that, it looks like a city, and they're just wasting the gas. So, it's a little bit of a problem. Um, is it not true there is still flaring in Australia as well? I don't believe so. I don't believe so. You think they are? Well, it's my understanding that um, of the first world countries, the U.S. was the only one everybody else had banned it. But I could be wrong. I could be wrong. Uh, I don't think but anyway, this I don't think it's banned in the U.K. either. I don't think it's banned in the U.K. No, I think it is. Because the company planning to drill in County Antrim, I'm pretty sure they yes. still talked about flaring in so their application. This well, is, then I have well, bad information. Well, this is the extent of well, this is the test, the flows, oh, yeah. etc. cetera. Well, they, but they want to flare at that stage. Oh, yeah. That's yeah, the, but they don't need to do that. It's an antiquated process. Well, they told us in public meetings that it was antiquated, it was old hat, it was found upon <coughs> the industry. So we thought, you know, it was a good news story that, you know, trust us. Mm -hmm. And then in the planning application, they're going to be flaring for 12 hours a day, etc. etc. et cetera. Et cetera. Yeah. So, yeah. Yeah, they claim they do it, well, they do do it to clean out the well bore, but they don't have to do it. They can use green completions, but it adds more cost to the well. <laughs> to, to the chair, so, uh, sorry, 30 years ago <coughs> in the Middle East and Saudi Arabia, I know they were burning off the gas, and then at that stage, they began to bottle it, you know, for consumption, uh, but I'm not sure what's happening there now, in the early 80s. Right, yeah. right. Well, um, the problem with this is that what the industry used to do, and the prudent thing to do, is when you're um, overproducing or if gas prices are that low, <coughs> they ought to shut in these wells. And, um, and that's what they should have done. Our gas price wouldn't have plummeted as much as it did if they had shut in the wells and done what the, the industry typically did. And, um, but they didn't do that. And I kept going around. That was one of the interesting things. That's how, actually how I got involved in this. because. I kept asking friends at home who were in the business, why are you still out there drilling when prices have plummeted so much? This was after the economic downturn, and nobody had a good answer for me. And um, the way I got involved in this is that I went to a Chamber of Commerce lunch where Aubrey McClendon came to town. He's our biggest driller. They were. Chesapeake was our biggest driller in Fort Worth. And um, he was throwing out numbers, and I was sitting there adding them up in my head, and I thought, I must have missed something. That doesn't make sense. Um, that can't be right. And I went home and I pulled Chesapeake's financials and when I saw these shale companies had incredible debt, I mean huge amounts of debt, no cash on their books, which was most unusual again for an oil and gas company. They usually sit on mountains of cash. They had no cash and it became very clear to me instantly that they were still out there drilling because they couldn't meet debt service unless they continued to drill. And then when I really started getting into it and looking at it, that's when I noticed these production price targets, or production targets, I mean, from the investment banks, which were encouraging them to drill even more. They had to meet production targets. And it was just, it was just the price of natural gas was just sliding. And by June, uh, sorry, January of 2012, 
nat gas in the U.S. went below two dollars in MCF, and some investment analysts were saying, well, it's going to go to zero. I mean, it's going to be absolutely worthless if they don't, you know, shut in production. This is another interesting fact. Some companies like um, Chesapeake and or Chesapeake's always kind of the bad boys, but some companies announced that they had cut production, and then when we went in and looked later, and it's not just me, um, uh, Reuters and Bloomberg also did some analysis, uh, they found that they cut it for like two days while they made this press announcement, and then they ramped it right back up. Mm -hmm. And um, so it never did really stabilize the price, so it's always been a problem.